Welcome to the Pick Museum of Anthropology's virtual tour of Hateful Things. This is a traveling exhibit from the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia at Ferris State University. My name is Rochelle Wilson, and I am the curator for the Pick Museum of Anthropology. This tour will be conducted today in part by Dr. Joseph Lynn, who I'm going to let introduce himself. Hi, I'm Dr. Joseph Lynn. I'm the Associate Director for Academic Affairs for the Center for Black Studies and Associate Professor of Curriculum and Instruction here at NIU. We're also and joined today by two wonderful students. My name is Logan Andrews and I am a student worker for the Center for Black Studies. My name is Galen Rivers and I'm a graduate research assistant at the Center for Black Studies. We'll be starting our virtual tour of Hateful Things today at the front wall, which is most appropriate because this is the first thing that visitors see when they come into the gallery space. Now, as noted previously, this is a traveling exhibit from Ferris State University's Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia. The exhibit, as you see it in here today, was conceived by Dr. David Pilgrim for his museum originally. And so as we're walking through, patrons will notice that there are two different types of labels. These white labels that you see, the object labels as well as these white panels, were actually created by Ferris State University as a part of their traveling exhibit. We have created supplementary panels in collaboration with the Center for Black Studies, and they are acting as supplementary panels to the information that you see from Ferris State. Because as we were going through the objects, we realized that there were themes that were sticking out to us. And we decided to, as we put these exhibits together, we grouped items according to these themes. Dr. Flynn wrote up these phenomenal supplementary panels, and we have hung them up according to the gallery and these objects within those themes. So today's exhibit, we will focus on how we have divided these up into the themes. We do need to note that Fair State, there are 38 objects, a part of that traveling exhibit. We have actually added two groupings of objects to this exhibit that do not belong to Ferris State. They are on loan from different loaners in the area. So the first grouping are the dolls that you see up in the front, primarily Mammy dolls, and those are on loan from Ms. Brenda Applewhite. And then on the back wall behind us, you will see a tablecloth that is on loan from an anonymous loaner. Beginning here is the perfect place to start. As you can see, we have a white only and colored sign. These two signs were iconic images of the Jim Crow era and probably the first thing people think about when they hear the term Jim Crow. These signs were used to demarcate uh, segregationist uh, accommodations. Um, so you would see these um, in front of grocery stores, in front of restaurants, movie theaters, and even churches sometimes. So before we go any further, we have to first define what Jim Crow actually is. Jim Crow uh, is the term used to refer to a system of state and federal laws that were meant to segregate society along racial lines. So when you see these kinds of signs, they were in service of maintaining a legal system of segregation. The figure goes back all the way into the antebellum period during the time of slavery. Um, and the Mammy is, I think, beloved so much because she projects this image of um, motherliness, uh, this maternal image. She um, was happy to do her work or happy in her work. Uh, her number one goal and priority was to take care of her white family, uh, either as a slave or as a domestic. Um, and again, this image is one that is consistently reproduced over and over and over again. Uh, probably one of the most, uh, two of the most iconic mammies that we can think of, of course, is Aunt Jemima from The Pancake Box as well as the character Mammy from Gone with the Wind, portrayed by the Oscar award-winning actress Hattie McDaniel. Again, probably one of the things that's really important to always remember about Mammy is that this was an image that was created uh, specifically to make the institution of slavery uh, appear more genteel, uh, more kind, more family-oriented even. Uh, in reality, though, the lives of enslaved African and African-American women was anything but genteel. 
So these images are also used to obscure um, the reality of these folks' lives. And I know you talked about how the Mammy figure is renowned worldwide, but also as, after speaking with Rochelle, some of these figures aren't just American. Some are from Barbados, some are from Jamaica. So is hateful things a phenomenon that's global or is it just like an American thing? Uh, it is a global phenomenon. Uh, you can find uh, some of these artifacts, especially the Mammy figurines. And uh, as, I'm, as I'm answering this, um, we also have to recognize that the Mammy figure appeared in a number of different ways. This image um, has been exported around the planet. You can find Mammy figurines in Tokyo, Japan, for example, uh, as well as the Caribbean, of course. So this is not a phenomenon um, that is located only in America. This has become a global product and almost always has been. As Rochelle pointed out, we've divided this exhibit into six uh, interesting themes. The first theme is household advertisements. Now, although there are a number of other um, uh, artifacts that we could look at, I thought that this would be a really interesting one to share real quick. Uh, this is an advertisement, um, a metal ad for uh, a, a small restaurant chain called Coon Chicken Inn. Uh, now this was a small restaurant chain uh, that was open from about the 1920s excuse me, to about the 1950s. Um, and as you can see, <clears throat> this uh, monkeyish, uh, coonish character is used as the advertising icon. Uh, and what was interesting about um, this particular restaurant chain is if uh, you can zoom in really close to this photograph, it's a picture of the actual restaurant. And to, to get, get into the restaurant, you had to walk through this caricature's smile. So Coon Chicken Inn definitely doubled down on how far they were stretching uh, this Coon iconography. Um, and also, you know, with the big red lips that harkens back to the era of blackface, which we'll talk about in a moment. So whenever we think of racism, we think of the South but this was in the Northwest of the United States. So was this inspired by racism in the South? Well, I think that something that people have to understand about these images as well as racism in general is that it wasn't located to one area of the country. Um, we kind of use the South as the avatar of racism, right? Um, because of the virulent racism and policies that were executed in the South. However, Separate but equal was a national policy. It was a national decision. So you could find segregated accommodations everywhere across the country. Uh, I was telling a friend of mine not too long ago that the historic nightclub, the Cotton Club, where you know performers like Duke Ellington played, uh, all the performers were black, right? But it was a segregated club. So you had to be white to be able to be seated at that club. So the idea that these kinds of images were only located in the South is, is a myth. In, in fact, you could have found these kinds of adver advertisements as well as iconography anywhere in the country. The next section of the exhibit is uh, called Hateful Media. Now, of all the images and um, aspects of media that we can think of that were deeply offensive to the African American community, blackface and the tradition of blackface is one of the most damaging. Uh, and this is uh, an, an artifact that is not only actual uh, blackface makeup, but also a wig and a picture of uh, Al Jolson dressed in blackface. 
Now, the thing about blackface is that it began in the 1840s uh, by a, a vaudeville entertainer named T.D. Rice. Uh, Rice had seen uh, an enslaved African, uh, African American doing um, a dance, and he then decided to darken his own, Rice that is, decided to darken his own skin uh, using burnt cork um, and put on uh, this a wig like this and began to lampoon African Americans uh, via that exaggerated dance. Um, this became one of the most persistent forms of popular American culture uh, well into the 1900s. As a matter of fact, um, theater groups, uh, high schools, churches were performing minstrel shows, uh, as they were called, uh, well into the 1950s. You may remember uh, blackface um, from er the early days of Hollywood. Uh, 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 films like uh, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, um, which is still considered to be one of the most racist documents we can ever have. Um, all of the black characters were, in, were actually white men dressed in blackface. And if you've ever seen that film, um, it is some really disturbing images. Um, but blackface began to start falling out of favor uh, when films converted to talkies. And then we begin to see the rise of new black stereotypes, such as uh, the reproduction of the mammy, the, introduce, the introduction of um, the Uncle Tom and the coon and the sambo and other stereotypical characters. In recent years, we've seen kind of a resurgence of blackface, like from college students and high school students and even some teachers. What is so appealing to people about blackface even to today? That's a good question, Galen. I think that, I think that people were so far removed from the blackface era that I don't think that people who are doing that really understand this history and understand why blackface was such a pernicious practice. They're not recognizing the simple fact, for example, that if you were an African-American perform performer in, say, 1920, um, there was an expectation that you, too, would wear blackface in order to be on stage and do your craft. So that psychic uh, and spiritual quagmire right there, you know, in order to do my work, I have to go out on stage and lampoon myself. Now, there were, there were performers like Burt Williams who, um, I don't want to say rescued blackface, but definitely offered uh, characters that had depth, um, characters that had complexity. Uh, and weren't just buffoons uh, for the entertainment of white folks. Now, we still see that kind of struggle in black Hollywood today. Um, so these things haven't necessarily gone away. They just look very different and not as egregiously offensive as they are here. But I think that people who are wearing blackface you know, in order to quote unquote be funny just don't really necessarily understand the full gravity of what blackface is, what it's about, and what its repercussions have been. The third part of our exhibit is called Hateful Childhood Things. Now, it's important to think about the fact that these artifacts were targeted specifically toward children. What you see right here are two paper masks from around the 1950s, and these masks were uh, clearly meant to uh, lampoon uh, African Americans. Now, what you would do is you could cut the mask out uh, you know, around the edge, and there are um, pre-made uh, holes that you could tie a string through and run around and wear them like a Halloween mask or uh, as a mask for play. So all kinds of people wear nose piercings and other piercings. So what makes these masks so savage? Well, as you can see, um, the masks were 
meant to imitate uh, Africans uh, from the continent. And um, in addition to um, the really grotesque features that you see, the over-exaggerated lips, uh, in this one you have sharp, jagged teeth, it's meant to convey the idea that Africans were somehow savage and, and or subhuman. Um, and now you also have to take this in contrast to the ways in which white Americans were popularly um, represented and depicted at the time. Typically white Americans were seen uh, as more intelligent, more refined, uh, the, you know, the pinnacle of self-respect and so on and so forth. And Africans and African Americans were typically um, represented as somehow subhuman or uncouth or dirty, um, you know, uh, unable to take care of oneself, et cetera. And, and right here, I think, again, children were putting these masks on their faces and, you know, mimicking their understanding of what it meant to be African without really having any significant opportunity for any kind of counter, um, counter images, since these images were so pervasive throughout society. So a lot of the items we've seen so far seem like they're from the last century. But this item seems almost new. Are some of these items still available, still being produced? Yes, Galen, actually they are. Um, I'm not going to share where you can find this stuff um, because I think uh, like many collectors, many collectors are not collecting these artifacts simply because they think they're cute. They're collecting these artifacts to take them out of circulation. Um, so for example, one of the pieces in our exhibit that we'll see in a few minutes uh, was um, loaned to us by a, by a lender, an anonymous lender. And when talking to that lender, we were told that that is a sp specific part of um, why they have that artifact in the first place, to take it out of circulation. But you can buy some of these things. This is Getopoly. This is, of course, a spoof on the classic board game Monopoly from Hasbro. Um, <clears throat> as, as you can see, um, it takes a number, <laughs> all the spaces from the traditional Monopoly board have been reappropriated to uh, feature what I guess we could say are stereotypical images or messages or representations from black culture. Now, the person who created this uh, is a gentleman named David Chang, uh, about uh, circa 2002. Uh, he says that he created this game uh, after having watched a number of um, music videos on BET and, and MTV, um, thinking about the ways in which uh, black men primarily are represented uh, in rap videos. Um, now, he of course was sued by uh, Hasbro, and as I understand, he countersued, and I, I don't think that the case has been settled yet, and you can still get a copy of this game. I do not recommend so, but you can get this, uh, get this game. Um, some of the things that are pretty interesting are um, the game pieces are no longer, you know, a car, a shoe, a hat, or an iron. Now they're bottles of 40 ounce liquor, uh, machine guns, as well as pot leaves and basketballs. So this is a way of, you know, showing the stereotypes about black culture and uh, black folks generally. Uh, all packaged in, uh, in a game board. This next part of the exhibit is particularly painful. It's called Fatal Hate and it examines lynching. If you're not familiar with lynching, it's the extrajudicial violence perpetrated against an individual, typically by a group. According to what we have recorded in history, there were over 4,400 lynchings that occurred between you know, the late 1800s and the mid 1960s. Um, at about the early 1900s, there were a number of people and organizations, including the NAACP and black journalists, 
like uh, uh, Ida B. Wells, who were protesting aggressively against the practice of lynching and leaning on Congress to pass uh, federal anti-lynching legislation. Unfortunately, that is still yet to happen. And although the lynching era has died out, um, the, the lasting impact of lynching uh, cannot be denied. Uh, it's a truly dark moment in American history because lynchings were some of the most horrific forms of violence that we can think of. Um, but it wasn't just the perpetrators of lynching that were disturbing. It was also the spectators. It was not uncommon for lynchings to happen um, in the town circle or the town square rather with thousands of people watching uh, like it was a picnic, literally. And so we have to think about what was going through people's minds that made it okay to allow their children to come to the town square to watch a black man being hung and immolated or burned, uh, burned on the noose, um, oftentimes for merely alleged crimes, not proven crimes. So one of the things that we have talked about is that, is this a federal crime? Uh, still to this day, it's not. Um, recently, uh, last year, um, the issue was taken up in Congress, but unfortunately they ended up not moving on it. So still to this day, there are no federal anti-lynching laws on the books. So, which is really too bad because uh, had there been federal uh, anti-lynching laws, then that would have meant that if uh, a lynching was found out or, or reported, then the federal government could have come in and handled those investigations and handled meeting out justice. And unfortunately, what was happening is it was getting kicked to, uh, these cases were being um, investigated uh, and sometimes tried uh, by state and local courts, uh, which were oftentimes you know, highly, highly racist. Um, as we know, uh, especially throughout the South at the time, um, during most of the 1900s, it was illegal for African Americans to serve on juries, uh, let alone testify. Now, in this particular image that we see here, these are replicas. These are recreations of a lynching um, in a more contemporary time. We, we often think that lynchings are in the past, but this is pretty contemporary. And we saw, you know, Obama, during the Obama administration, these same images coming out. Why is this still so pervasive? Like, why is this still happening? Well, I think this is, this is another tip of the hat to the idea that as Americans, we really aren't all that familiar with this history. Um, or at least, at, at the very least, we take it for granted. And, and so these images get reproduced by certain groups um, that have oftentimes nefarious intentions. Um, even when they're just trying to be funny, I still think that using a noose um, next to the image of a president is not necessarily you know, something that's safe. Um, but these practices haven't really ever gone away. And I think that's a part of why they um, persist. Um, so for example, in the latter 1990s, we have had the case of uh, James Byrd, man in Texas, who was lynched. Uh, he was tied to the end of a car or a truck and dragged down the street, you know. And, and so, you know, what this does is that it reminds us that there has been this historic disdain or lack of care and concern about the black body in and of itself. Um, so when people say black lives matter, I don't think that that's simply an issue about, um, about law enforcement. I think that's a collective statement to recognize that throughout the history of African Americans um, or Africans in America, um, there has been this just wanton violence perpetrated against black folks that often has gone unaccounted for. And I think seeing an image like this and, and seeing um, these images of um, black bodies hanging 
um, like the song says in the Southern Breeze, uh, kind of just is a meant to remind us that these are still issues that we're having to deal with. And in addition to the Jim Crow Museum for Racist Memorabilia, another really powerful museum is the Equal Justice Initiative Museum down in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, that is dedicated to uh, preserving this, this history of lynchings. And they are actively counting the number of lynchings that they can find uh, that have been recorded. And then before we sign off here, it's always important to remember that number of 4,400 lynchings is an estimate of the actual number of lynchings. You know, that's what we've been able to find through, through records, um, you know, newspaper articles, etc. We're not even talking about the ones that weren't reported. Right. You know, the thousands of uh, children oftentimes that went missing, right? You know, we don't know whether or not they were lynched. You know, we don't know how they came to you know, expire. And so this is still a problem that plagues the country. And it's a conversation that the nation really needs to have, especially in light of the uh, rallying cry of Black Lives Matter. The next section of the exhibit is called Hateful Daily Indignities. Um, there's a wide range of artifacts that are featured in this uh, part of the exhibit. However, I really wanted to show this particular artifact since it's actually a legal document. This is a deed uh, for property. Uh, it comes from uh, 1926 uh, from the city of Baltimore. And why this is important is because it shows uh, the practice of restrictive covenants. Restrictive covenants were contracts between uh, uh, private sellers of property to um, whomever they were selling to that would allow um, the person to dictate who could and who could not um, either rent or even purchase that property at a later date. So if you can see here, I'll read it, um, a part of, of what this says is that subject to the following conditions. Uh, the third condition says that neither said lot nor any part thereof shall be sold, leased, transferred to, or permitted to be occupied by any Negro or Chinese, this restriction not to apply to employees of owners or occupants of said lots. So. It was legal in the United States for quite some time to restrict African Americans and others, including Jews, uh, indigenous Americans, uh, Latinos, from um, purchasing or renting particular properties. Now, this, this practice was ultimately outlawed. Um, however, the housing industry and the federal government did find ways around restrictive covenants um, you had a number of neighborhoods as the beginning, at the beginning of the rise of the suburbs uh, in post-World War II America, entire communities that had restrictive covenants disallowing um, units to be sold to African-American families. And this, um, according to economists, is one of the primary reasons why we still see this huge wealth gap between um, white Americans and uh, African Americans. And is this also part of the reason why, like even through to today, we only see black people in certain neighborhoods or certain parts of neighborhoods or certain areas of cities? Yes, yeah. um, that's a great question. Uh, there was a practice called redlining um, that was sanctioned by the federal government. Uh, and simply what it was is that once the federal government began issuing home loans uh, through the FHA program, uh, Federal Housing Administration program in the 1930s, um, they had to value uh, different neighborhoods to see you know, what kind of risk they were. And almost summarily, they um, put a, what we call a red line through uh, predominantly black and or Latino uh, neighborhoods across the country. And what that did was that it 
drove the property values of those neighborhoods down and made them high risk uh, for, for home loans and even business loans. So if you were a black person, uh, say on the south side of Chicago in the 1940s, and you wanted to try to buy a home, there was a higher likelihood that you would not be able to buy a home in that community because of the risk that, um, um, that uh, the banks were saying um, that neighborhood was worth. Now this was aggravated even more because there were many places in cities that would not sell to black families a la through restrictive covenants and other practices. So the idea that you could go anywhere and buy a home and live the American dream was only true for some people. And again, the effects of the, of the decades long practice, um, you know, we can still feel today, even though it is illegal to do so. Another artifact from our Hateful Daily Indignity section is this license plate from circa 1964 during the uh, Johnson and Goldwater uh, ca presidential campaign. Um, it says, I went all the way with LBJ. Now, uh, during that campaign, uh, um, President Johnson, um, his slogan was, go all the way with LBJ. And clearly this is a spoof on that. Um, but I think what people really need to pay attention to is the way in which um, this black woman is represented um, using uh, with the hair and um, braids sticking out of her head, uh, the big red lips, and uh, this particular uh, character is wearing uh, house shoes, a uh, dress, and she's clearly uh, pregnant. Now, this was supposed to communicate um, uh, lasciviousness or sexuality among black women. Also the idea of black women as um, uh, unmarried mothers. And you always have to, you know, strike this or compare this image to the ways in which white women were being represented at the time. So in mid 1960s, white women were oftentimes uh, represented as refined, uh, self, uh, self reliant. They were, you know, depicted as being the um, the paragons of beauty and glamour and grace, et cetera, et cetera. While these images clearly show uh, black women in a more derogatory uh, representation. So, why did Lyndon B. Johnson receive an overwhelming amount of supporters uh, from black voters? Well, at the time, uh, you know, uh, Johnson, of course, uh, was the vice president to um, John F. Kennedy, who, of course, was assassinated in uh, December of 1963. Um, and then Johnson went on to win the presidential campaign the following year. Um, the platform that Johnson was running on uh, was pro-civil rights, while Goldwater's campaign um, was not. Um, Goldwater uh, is considered one of the original classical conservative uh, politicians. Um, <clears throat> but unfortunately, um, the, what the group of people called the Dixiecrats, who were Democrats, but they were also Southern segregationists, they were not in favor of um, Johnson uh, and his more progressive um, pro-civil rights policies. And so this is where you start seeing the beginning of the Southern Democrats, or the Dixiecrats, as they were called again, uh, fleeing from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. And, and, and that, you know, in that period of the mid-60s to the early 1970s, that's when you begin to see this, this sea change in uh, political representation of these ideas. The last part of our exhibit is called Hateful Household Things. Um, and although this item was not featured in the home, it was usually uh, placed right outside the home, like on the front porch or something like that. So this artifact um, comes from the 1960s and was in circulation uh, well into the 1980s. 
And um, the way this uh, item worked is usually it was painted and um, each level or each area of the body had a, a point score um, for you to hit. Um, now, if you, pardon the language, but if you got a head shot, um, you hit the uh, head of the target, uh, that was often worth, worth the lowest number of points. While if you hit the feet, that was often the highest points. So these items, um, this history of uh, negative representations of African Americans, dehumanized representations of African Americans, is still a practice. This is not something um, from decades ago. Because, uh, to the point, you can get an item like this off many um, white supremacist websites. Um, so that's that. That's a terrible ending. It is, but given the fact that items like this exist and the political context and the events that have taken place in the last year, do you feel that items like this have had an effect on the, on the way Americans understand these events and how they react to them? Well, one of the, that's a great question first, um, but I think one of the problems is that I don't think many Americans recognize how pervasive these kinds of uh, artifacts actually are. Um, but oftentimes when um, a racial incident breaks out, sales of things like bees and ghetto and getopoli and um, other uh, racist memorabilia um, tends to raise their uh, sales. So there is an audience, uh, a market rather, that, in, that wants to purchase these kinds of products. So to say that this is uh, something that's old and from the past, you know, why do we talk about these things still? Well, it's because they're still in circulation. People are still creating these products and they still make money from these products. And those products then get distributed out into the, into the nation. And so if we um, are really serious, <clears throat> excuse me, are we, if we're really serious about um, reclaiming the image of African Americans or you know, making moves toward anti-blackness, then we have to think about how these kinds of uh, artifacts have an impact on the popular consciousness. And arguably why their sales increase when racial incidents happen, or even to today, that there's still a wide enough market that these are being made. Exactly. The last artifact we'd like to show you in the exhibit is this gorgeous, gorgeous tapestry. It is actually a tablecloth uh, that comes from about 1950, uh, around mid-century um, in the United States. And as you can see, it is the depiction of a pastoral image of um, mammies and um, possibly toms, uh, as well as uh, piccaninny figures, um, you know, tending the field as well as eating um, watermelon and holding a chicken. So um, in many regards, it hits a lot of these um, classic stereotypes that had been circulated about African Americans. But I think the thing that really pops out to me about um, this item, which again is on loan to us from an anonymous donor, is just the craftsmanship of, of this item. You know, it it's, wasn't thrown together. This is a high quality, uh, well-produced um, tablecloth that could have been on any table um, anywhere in the United States. Uh, we do know that there is a story behind this particular artifact. Um, the person who um, loaned it to us bought it from a garage sale uh, in North Dakota and um, saw it and took it upon um, herself to uh, preserve uh, this item. Um, this particular uh, uh, lender um, is one of those people that buys these artifacts and, and stores them away um, and only sells them to people for educational purposes. Um, so I, on camera, I want to thank um, our uh, anonymous lender for uh, letting us use this item. Um, but I think that 
you have to always kind of just stop and take in um, the the craftsmanship that was put into this into this item, and the ways that these uh, caricatures are represented so trivially, you know. And this is just another household item, and but you have to understand that this was one of thousands, if not millions, of household items across the country that had traditionally um, racist um, representations of African Americans. Um, so through this exhibit, we hope to help the, the public understand how pervasive these images were, how deeply insensitive and dehumanizing these uh, representations were, and ultimately how they continue to have a powerful impact on the ways in which African Americans are represented in the United States and around the world. So this tablecloth was used to reflect the values, beliefs, and ideologies of people's households. So what does this teach those who use it? Well, that's a really great question. And I think specifically to this artifact, I think it reinforces this idea that African Americans served particular functions in society. On one hand, they're represented, you know, doing field work, right? Um, on the other hand, this is just a common item in the house. So it also, you know, kind of, you know, presents this idea that African Americans are here, you know, for entertainment, for consumption. Um, and there are no stories behind these stereotypical images. There are no stories behind these people. And I think that's part of the thing that I think is so important about um, becoming familiar um, with uh, Jim Crow memorabilia. These images were meant to replace the fact that there were real live human beings going through some very horrific things while also creating some of the most beautiful works of music, art, literature, film, um, you know, uh, ministers, doctors, lawyers, dentists, teachers, you know, that these images were supposed to be mocking, right? And so I think that we always have to remember that behind every image that we see, there are real life people. And what's more important to honor the people or to honor the image? And I would dare to say that it's more important to honor the people that these images are supposed to be caricatured. So I wanna thank everybody today for joining us on this virtual tour. I also wanna give a huge shout out and thanks to Dr. Flynn, Logan, and Galen for joining me today on this virtual tour and conducting this tour. I also wanna thank Chris Mitchell for recording this video for us today and putting it together. If anybody is interested in coming to visit Hateful Things, it is available at the Pick Museum of Anthropology at Northern Illinois University in Cole Hall. Tickets are free to come and see us. You do have to get your tickets online through Eventbrite. It is an advanced ticketing system uh, for 45 minute slots. And so if anybody is interested, you can visit the Pick Museum of Anthropology's website to find the links to that. The exhibit is on display from February 2nd through April 9th, 2021. And I will encourage you while you are here to help, um, help us build a quilt. So while you're here, you can build a quilt square, create this, and then all these squares will be collected at the end of the exhibit. And they will be uh, used to create a quilt that will be housed at the Center for Black Studies to um, celebrate and advocate for black lives.